Good morning, church. Good morning and greetings in the strong name of Jesus. Will you stand as we proclaim God's praises this morning? Sing of his goodness and of his mercy. And this morning, church, let's proclaim that God is good. And all the time, amen. Celebrate the goodness of God this morning. This is a God that can be trusted, a God that's never going to let us down. Let's sing it out. You're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. Sing it out. You're never going to let. Never gonna let me down. Oh, never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Proclaim it. Oh, never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. See now, you are good. You are good. Good. Oh. morning church let me you say amen sing it out you are good This morning, church. Are you expecting the return? The return of the King, of Christ Almighty. It's not to sing these words, but believe them with our hearts. Hosanna, God, come quickly. So we wait. So come, even so come, Lord Jesus, come, even so come, Lord 
Jesus the altar boldly church church, the miry clay that the Lord lifted you up from, his beauty, his goodness, his majesty. Do you believe that he is a wonderful God this morning, church? Let me hear you say amen. Do you believe that he is wonderful? Let me hear you say amen. Thank you, Jesus. Sing it out. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Claim it, church. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Oh, right there. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Bow down before Him, 
morning church let's join in singing with Job that though you slay me yet I'll praise you to look upon the goodness and the loveliness of Christ seeing my heart and flesh may fail this morning I know that many of you are going through different battles and struggles We all come here today going through different trials, trials and struggles, some sick, some hurting, some going through things that we, we can't do it on our own, suffering, the world around us seems to be falling apart, maybe your, your marriage, your family, maybe at work, your job, whatever you're going through, I want to encourage you that, that Jesus is enough. He is enough. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellence of the power of God and not of us, we're hard pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. 
always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Jesus, we thank you that you're enough. No, no matter what we're going through, you're still God, you're still on the throne, Lord, and we can come to you, and we can find strength, we can find comfort, we can find peace, we can find joy, Lord, because you're enough. Lord, no matter what we're going through, you're still God, you're still on the throne, and we can trust in you, we can count it all joy, knowing that these trials that we're going through, Lord, they bring perseverance and character and character of hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through Christ Jesus. So we worship you, Lord. We worship you in the trials, in the struggles, in the difficulties, in the pain. Lord, we praise you, Lord. We praise you. We come to the altar, Lord. We come broken and thirsty and hurting, and we know, Lord, that you're here. We thank you, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name. You slay me, yet I will praise you, though you take from me, I will bless your name, though you and me, still I will worship, sing a song to the one who's all. To the one who's all I need. Sing a song to the one who's all I need. Amen. God, we thank you for your goodness. That despite the trials, we do have that hope. We thank you for your death, your burial, your resurrection. God, that you'd be glorified now in this time. For your name's sake, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You're going to be hearing a lot of amens this morning. So, well, good morning and greetings in the strong name of Jesus. Welcome to Horizon South Bay. Will you please take some time to really greet those around you? Kids, of any, you're dismissed. Got me muted. I turned it on. Got it. I'll talk louder. How about that? I'll knock. Bring up down below. All right, well, this is a new. Get it fixed before Pastor Eric comes up. That's the important part. Good morning, everybody. Today is the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It's based on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. Uh, not Natalie, play that. On Friday, they had a March for Life in Washington, D.C. This is a time-lapse photography from Students for Life taking it there. 
Uh, they had a permit for like 50,000 on the National Mall, and it's been estimated that 150,000 showed up for the March for Life. That's pretty crazy. I know. It, it's totally not political, although people like to make it political, but in each person, every human, is the Imago Dei, which is the image of God. And so every life is important. Uh, out on the table out in the lobby there, I have, there's a, a few of these. It's five Bible passages that the affirm the personhood of the unborn to show that God chooses life for us too. So anyways, that is so cool. Isn't that the best? Yeah. Uh, another thing, the marriage and premarital uh, prepare and rich group. I have the list here. I will send an email or uh, I'll call you if I don't have your email just to set it up. It'll be, it'll be on Monday evenings um, soon. As soon as I get all my ducks in a row. Quack. And that's it. Next. Good morning, church. How we doing? We're so happy you guys are here today to join us to uh, worship and just hear God's word. Uh, just a couple brief announcements. Um, every Thursday, just, just a reminder, every Thursday from 6.30 to 8, uh, there is evangelism. Um, and you guys are meeting at the door. Uh, while we're in youth, uh, parents, I'd like to encourage you guys to, to go out to the community with Pastor Eric to evangelize. And um, also, it's this Saturday, right? This Saturday, uh, January 29th at 9.30 to noon. Uh, there's also going to be evangelism. Uh, this, we do this monthly, right? Last Saturday of the month, uh, we'll be evangelizing and also meeting at the door. So come join us. Uh, and also, Women's Bible Study has begun. Uh, it is the Fruitful Life book by Jerry Bridges, and women purchase it and join the rest of the ladies at the door from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And just a reminder, men, Bible study is also going to be at 6.30, so join your wife and come down and just fellowship. Uh, let's pray for today's tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to be here just to be in your presence, to worship, to hear your word. Lord, I pray that you use Pastor Eric just to speak to our hearts. Uh, tell us uh, what you want us to hear, Lord. And Lord, I pray for the classes for the kids today, Lord. And Lord, we pray for the tithes and offerings that they just continue to be a blessing to all the missionaries and all the purposes that you have for them, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. So blessed to see you all today. Open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Those of you who are at home, thank you for being with us today. Those of you who are sick, we're praying for you that you will get better. Romans chapter 12. As we, just a quick review of the book of Romans, Paul has uh, so many amazing things, but ultimately the, the focus of Romans has been um, doctrinal. He's teaching that we are saved by grace through faith. He starts in <clears throat> Romans chapter 1 talking about how God is proclaimed through his creation so that there is no one that has excuse. He talks about in Romans 23 that there's none good, no, not one. That we've all turned away from God. We've all sat after our own things. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. He continues in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, talking about how the wage of sin, the payment for our sin is death. But then he gives the hope, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, he talked about how nothing can separate us from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus. And then in Romans 9, 10, and 11, he begins to talk about the Jewish nation and how God has not abandoned them, but that God still loves them. And if they would come to faith in Jesus Christ, they could be saved. And talking about the mercies of God. Remember, he talked in chapter 11 about how both Jew and Gentile 
need God's grace and God's mercy to be saved. Jesus is the only way. No one can get to God except through Him. He is the name above all names. So in verse chapter 12, He's then going to move away from doctrine, which is explaining and teaching. He's going to move now to prescribing and explaining how we should respond to God. So he's taught about God's grace and mercy and how we all need it. And apart from him, we're lost and we have no hope. And now he's saying, so how do we respond? How do we respond to his grace and mercy? So Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do, me, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these words, these words of encouragement, these words, Lord, that, that teach us how we should respond to your grace and to your mercies. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand what this is, what this living sacrifice is. Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be that living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. Lord, we're saved by grace through faith. And we thank you, Lord. But how do we respond to that grace and mercy, Lord? So help us today as we read these words to understand and help us to be that living sacrifice. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, starting here, says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So he's speaking to brethren, Christians. How many of you here are Christians? Accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. If your hand's not raised, then let's talk after church. All right? Because today is the day of salvation. It says, I beseech you, brethren. That word beseech, that's not a word that we normally use today. Uh, but beseech means to, to beg, to plead, to exhort, to encourage. Paul is saying, okay, based upon the mercies of God, I beseech you. I beg you. I plead with you. So Paul has laid out the mercies of God. In all of this that we've been reading from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 11, he's talked about how we've all disobeyed God. We all deserve God's wrath. We're separated from him. There's none good. No, not one. But through faith in Jesus, we can have eternal salvation. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? So he says, based upon that mercy... Remember the word mercy is God doesn't punish us like we deserve. It's undeserved that, that, that God, we deserve to be punished. And God's mercy is I'm not going to punish you like you deserve. God's grace is he blesses us even when we don't deserve to be blessed. So based upon his grace and his mercy, Paul begs and pleads the Christian. The Christian who in Rome and the Christian throughout history and the Christian us today. He begs and pleads them with them based upon God's mercy and forgiveness, we're adopted into God's family, we have eternal life, the Holy Spirit living inside of us, based upon that mercy, our response should be presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Paul says that we would lay our bodies down like a living sacrifice. Notice it's not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the Jewish people would have to come before God and they would have to bring a sacrifice and they would bring an animal and they would sacrifice that animal on the altar to receive forgiveness of sins. But through faith in Jesus, we no longer have to bring a sacrifice or an offering to God. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen? So instead of offering a dead animal sacrifice, which ultimately could never really cover their sins, Paul pleads with the believer that instead they would come to Jesus giving of themselves, of their lives, of their bodies. Using the body and the life that God has given us 
to glorify him. That our hands would be God's hands. We would give them to him and say, Lord, here is my body. Here are my hands. Here are my eyes. Here are my feet. Here is my mouth. And we would give that to him to be used by him to bring him honor and glory as a living sacrifice. The Gnostics taught that you could do whatever you wanted with your physical body and that that wouldn't hurt your spiritual relationship with God. These bodies could do whatever. You could live in sin. You could drink and party and, and, and sexual promiscuity and whatever, and you could still come to church on Sunday and worship God, and there would be no problem because our bodies and our, our spirits are separate. That's not biblical. Paul teaches in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says we as Christians, understanding God's mercy and compassion and grace, our response should be presenting our bodies, our lives, our time, everything that we are, everything that we have unto him and saying, Lord, here I am. Do with me as you would want to do. He says, I'm crucified. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live, I live in faith for him who loved me and gave himself for me. And because he gave himself for me, I now will live my life for him. Remember, we're saved by grace through faith. Amen? It's not of works. So Paul's not talking about we need to present our bodies as a sacrifice to be forgiven of sins. He's not saying you need to give your bodies to God, your life to God, so that you can receive salvation and earn your salvation because we can't earn our salvation. We're saved by the faith. We're saved by grace through faith. In Jesus, in his finished work on the cross, the work is done. However, now that we're saved, now that we're born again, now that the Holy Spirit lives within us, should we continue in sin so that God's grace will abound? Paul says, by no means. Instead, as it says in Ephesians 2.10, right after it says we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, Paul says we are his workmanship. We are his poema. We're his poem. We're God's beautiful work of art created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are God's workmanship. We're his poem. We're his work of art, and he's working in us to transform us for good works, so that we can honor and please him with our lives. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Thinking back to the sacrifice in the Old Testament, it had to be holy. It had to be pure and without blemish. It had to be set apart for God. And there couldn't be anything wrong with it. It couldn't have broken leg. It couldn't have any scars. It had to be perfect and spotless. And that's how Jesus came, the Lamb of God, perfect, sinless. We in Christ, the Bible says, are dead to sins and alive to God. So we come to him being purified, being washed, being new. We've been declared holy. But being declared holy by the blood of Jesus, once again, we should also be responding by living a life of holiness. Living a life set apart from sin unto God. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, Flee, run from sexual immorality. 
Every sin that a man does is outside of the body, but he who commits sexual morality sins against his own body. It says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Talks about here how we are a holy temple, set apart for God, holy, set apart to serve him and to love him and to be set apart from sin. He says, flee from sin, flee from sexual immorality, flee from sin because the temp- we are the temple of God. He lives inside of us through his Holy Spirit. So we were bought with a price. It was free to us. The Bible says that the gift of God, it's free. It's a gift. We didn't have to pay it. We can't earn it. But it cost Jesus everything. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So once again, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, living a life that is holy and pleasing to God, isn't to earn God's favor. We already have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. But we do it in a response to God's grace and mercy in our lives. Responding to the work that he's done, we respond in thanks by living our lives holy and pleasing unto him. He says, which is your reasonable service? It is reasonable when we understand God's mercy when we understand how God hasn't punished us like we deserve, the reasonable response, the logical response, is that we would give him our lives and we would live a holy life unto him. The unreasonable response, the illogical response, is that we would continue to live a life of sin. That's not reasonable. That doesn't make sense. Jesus died for us so that we could live for him. And our reasonable response would be to surrender our lives to him. Lord, here I am. What would you have me do today? Lord, here I am. My eyes, my body, my feet, my arms, my mind, I give it all to you. I want to glorify you. Help me to be holy, set apart from sin. Be that new creation. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is past and all things are made new. It's happened. We're a new creation. So that we would live as that new creation, leaving behind the past sin and using our lives, our bodies to glorify God. That is our reasonable service. He says, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed or fashioned according to this world or this age. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. So we shouldn't be seeking after the things of this world and conforming ourselves to this world and to the systems of this world. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, speaking of a Christian before Christ, he says, you he made alive who were once dead in your trespasses and sins. And when she once walked, According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom you once were also conducted yourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. So in Ephesians, he's saying, look, this is who you were. Before Christ, you lived according to the currents or the stream or the, you followed after the world and everything that the world offered. This is what you lived for. This is what I lived for. We lived for fame and popularity and money and riches and for pleasure. That's what drove us. We were riding that wave. It ultimately says when we were following after the world, We were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, ultimately the devil. Because this world system and all that it offers is a lie to distract us from God and God's will for our life. And it's ultimately run by the devil. And it feeds our flesh, our sinful nature. And he says, that's who you once were. You were dead in your sins. 
but now you've been a made alive by Christ. So why, if we've been, if we're dead to our sins and alive in Christ, then why would we continue to follow this world and the things that brought us under the wrath of God? He says, no, instead, don't be conformed to this world. Don't follow after this world. Don't dress like them. Don't look, look like them. Don't watch what they watch. Listen to what they listen to. Don't believe what they believe. And I know that it's hard because everywhere we go, television and radio and, and our friends and family, it's all the world and this is what the world offers and it's tempting. But Jesus says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind. That word transformed is where we get our word metamorphosis. To be changed into something new. Like a butterfly. that is a caterpillar. It enters into its cocoon and it comes out and it's a beautiful new creation. A beautiful new butterfly. And the same for us. We have been transformed. It says it once again, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed. The old caterpillar, he's passed. All things are made new in Christ Jesus. This has already happened when we gave our lives to Christ. The Bible says that we were born again. His spirit came and lived inside of us. We were given a new heart. The old man has passed. All things are made new. This transformation begins at the moment of salvation. When we give our lives to Jesus, the Bible says we're, we're born again instantly. We instantly receive the Spirit of God. We're no longer children of wrath, but we're now children of God. However, there's still a process of sanctification going on in our lives where we're being transformed day by day into the image of God, into the image of Christ Jesus. We're being transformed, as it says here, by the renewing of our mind. The renewing of our minds through the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's Word. As we spend time in God's Word, as we spend time in prayer, as we come to church, as we meditate upon God, as we draw near to Him through the Holy Spirit, He's transforming us. He's renewing our mind so that our thoughts and our desires from the past, that old man will be left in the past. And we will be made new. We will be renewed. It says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrows and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is living. What does that mean? How is this alive? It's a book. It's alive through the Holy Spirit as we read it. God, through His Spirit, speaks to us and transforms us, gives us life, and transforms us into the image of His Son, Jesus. It's powerful. It has power to change our beliefs. It has power to give us victory over sin. The Bible says faith comes through hearing and hearing the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, the woman of God, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. He says, be, do not be conformed to the world. We need to remember that the world does not, we are not of this world. We're passing through. We're here for a time. And yes, we live in this world. Yes, we have to work. Yes, we need to eat. Yes, we need to pay our rent and, and pay for a house. And it's expensive. And yes, we, we can enjoy God's creation and God's beauty and family and friends and all of those things. But being conformed to the world is being conformed to sin and to the desires of this world following after this world, following after riches, following after fame, following after pleasure instead of surrendering our lives to God. It says don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed into the image of Christ by the renewing of your mind that you may prove <clears throat> what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As a Christian, 
as our mind is renewed through God's word and through the leading of the Holy Spirit, then we are able to prove or test or understand or deem worthy God's good and perfect will for our lives. As a Christian, and we spend time in God's Word, and God's Holy Spirit is working in us, what it does is allows us to see and understand God's will. Not our own will, not what I want, not what I desire. God, what do you want? As Jesus sat in the, on the, in the, in the garden the night of his death, he said, Lord, take this cup from me, but if not, not my will, but your will be done. And that as we spend time in God's word and our mind is renewed, that we would understand God's will. We would understand his will each and every single day. God, what is your will for my life today? God, how can I live for you? How can I present my body as a living sacrifice for you today? Today, Lord, here I am. Today, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to glorify you. I want to bring you honor. I want to be holy. Lord, what is your will? What is your desire? The other day I was going to, I don't remember what I was going to do. I thought I was going to do something, but I didn't get to do it. So I went to Home Depot and I just went to buy a, uh, my, my, my washing machine has been leaking for a couple of weeks. And I thought it was one thing, but I found out it wasn't. It was something else. It was just, it was just my drain pipe had a hole in it. So I had to go to Home Depot and get a new, uh, get a new drain. This wasn't what I was going to be doing. I was going, oh, I was going to go visit somebody, but I couldn't go visit them because they, they weren't able to, for some reason. So I went to Home Depot, I got my, 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 my drain pipe, but as I'm in the parking lot, I see all these, these, these Haitian guys, they're waiting for a job, they're looking for a job, there's about 15 of them. So I just went up to them and just started talking to them. Um, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but I said, uh, at the beginning of the year, I'm going to evangelize with at least one person a day. And praise God, I've been able to do that. Um, I did miss one day, but, but I've been going every day. And, and that day, it was like, all right, Lord, here I am. There's all these Haitian guys, all 15 of them. And I went, and uh, I bought them some pizza, and I bought a Pepsi or two, and I just sat down with them and talked with them and shared Jesus with them and prayed with them. And I was faithful to minister to them. It was God's will. That wasn't my will. That wasn't my plan. I, I didn't really, I was going to buy a drain pipe. They were there, sitting in the parking lot, just hanging out. The security guard came over, and he was going to tell us to leave. I could tell, but he heard me preaching God's word, and he just walked away. God is good, and that we would know his good and perfect will each and every single day. Lord, what, what today, what is your will? What, do you, what can I do? How can I honor you? How can I serve you, Lord? I don't want to live in the flesh. I give you my body, my eyes, my heart, my hands. Here I am. And we would know as good and acceptable and perfect will. How? By the renewing of our mind. By sitting every day, Lord. Here I am, by sitting in prayer, by sitting in his word, and seeking after him, and, and, and offering our lives and our hearts and our minds to God here. Lord, here it is. Here I am. I beseech you. I beg of you. I plead with you. When we understand God's mercy and grace, that we would offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. That is our reasonable service. Not being conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can prove, understand, that we can deem worthy God's good and acceptable and perfect will. Verse 3, he says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, 
he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. To help the believers present their bodies as a living sacrifice, Paul remembers, reminds them to be humble and to not think of themselves more mighty than they should, but to remember that we're saved by grace through faith. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. The faith, he even says here, the faith that we have was given to us by God. We didn't believe. We believe because God gave us the ability to believe. He gave us faith. He allowed us to believe. He had grace and mercy, and he gave us faith. So we can't even be proud of our faith. We can't even, we didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. So he says, because of that, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. We are members of one body. So he says, as we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, we're serving the body of Christ. We're one body. We come together serving God, serving each other, being the body of Christ. He says, we are many members, but we're one body. All believers, Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, free, slaved, rich, poor, man, woman, we're all one body and in Christ. As we present our bodies, ultimately, we're serving God. We're serving the body of Christ. It says, being all members of one body, we don't have the same function. So being many are one body, and in Christ, individually, as members of one another. So just as the body, our physical bodies, have different members, and each member has a different function. We have fingers, right? And our fingers are to grab things. We have eyes, our eyes are to see things, ears, our ears are to hear things, our feet, they're to walk. We have lots of other things that we don't even know what they're for, but they have some purpose, right? It says, every body part has a function. And so we, as members of the body of Christ, we all have a function, we all have a purpose. We all have, we all are needed as the body. He says in verse 6, having then gifts according to the grace that is given to us. Again, he talks about gifts. And the gifts are given to us by grace. Meaning we don't earn our gifts and we don't deserve our gifts. Just as we're saved by grace through faith, the gifts that God has given to us, he gives us by grace. We can't earn it and we don't deserve it. Sometimes we look at somebody and say, man, look at them. Look how God is using them. Look at their gift. I want a gift like that. And we think that if we do this or that, then we can earn that gift. Or they must be more holy than me. And that's why God gave them that gift. But the Bible says here it's based upon God's grace. Because ultimately, there's none good, no, not one. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to read more as we get into the book of Corinthians about the gifts, but he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, but he says, one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So it talks about how God, the Holy Spirit, gives us gifts according to his will, according to what he needs in the body of Christ. It says, just as each of our body parts has a purpose and a place, so the Spirit distributes gifts to each and every one of us. And every person has a gift and are important and necessary to the well-being of the whole body. Once again, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 21, it says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. In other words, just as all of our body parts are necessary and have a function and a purpose, so all of us, as the body of Christ, are necessary and have a function and a purpose. I love Rayson and Chrissy and Robbie up here singing and drums and guitar, and I praise God for that gift. Because it's a gift that I don't have. If I was up here singing and playing the drums, you would all probably leave. Um, and it's a gift. I have, a, I have the gift, I believe, of evangelism. Maybe you don't have the gift of worship. Maybe you don't have the gift of evangelism. 
But you have a gift that God has given you to serve and glorify the body of Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians again, 12, 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So the gifts are for the profit of the whole body. It's for all of our good. The body works together and it's for all of our good. If I'm evangelist, I'm evangelist. Why? To grow the body of Christ, not to grow my kingdom. If you have the gift of worship, it's not so everybody looks at you and says, wow, look at them, they're so great. If you have the gift of preaching or healing, it's not to increase your bank account and buy yourself an airplane so you can travel all over the world and heal more people. The gifts are to be used for the benefit of the entire body, to glorify God and to grow the body of Christ. He says, since the gifts are for the benefit of all, verse 6, let us use them. The gifts are to be used. So I ask this question today, are you using your gift? I guess before that question, I should say, what is your gift? And if you don't know, I believe that God has given you a gift and he wants you to use it for the body of Christ. And if you're not using it as the body, we're missing something. We're missing out. It's kind of like I hurt hurt my finger the other week. And once this finger was hurt, my my whole hand, you know, suffers because that one body part is not doing its job because it's hurt. And the same as the body of Christ. The body of Christ, to be healthy and strong and grow and flourish, each member needs to be doing its part. So he says... Let us use these gifts. If prophecy, let us prophesy. I'm going to proportion to our faith. If it's ministry, let us ministry. Let us use it in ministry. Teaches and teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And Paul gives a list of different gifts. These are not all of them. But these are some of the gifts that God gives to his church for the good of the entire church. He says, number one, if prophecy, let us prophesy. According to Strong's, the word prophecy means discourse or words emanating from divine inspiration and declaring the purposes of God, whether for reproving or for admonishing the wicked, for comforting the afflicted, or revealing things that are hidden. When we think of prophecy, we always think of things that are hidden. But sometimes a word of prophecy could just be a word of encouragement to somebody. It could be a word of, you know what, you need to stop doing that. But it comes directly from the Lord to you to share with someone else. Maybe it's through a, a, a vision. Maybe it's through a dream. Maybe it's as you're sitting in God's word or you're sitting in prayer. God, we put something on your heart and you don't want to say it, but you got to say it because you know it's from the Lord. It's a gift of prophecy, a word from God for you to share with the church or for you to share with someone else or for you to share with, with the lost world. I believe that it's a gift for today. I believe that many people today that say they're prophets, thus says the Lord. Um, I think we need to align God's prophecy or God, uh, if God gives you a word, it needs to align with Scripture. So we always need to bring it to God's word, but I believe that God does. Prophets give people a word of knowledge, a word of discernment, a word today that is directly from him to share with someone else. Verse 7 says, if your gift is ministry, let us use that gift in ministering. The word ministry is diakono or diakonia, which literally means to serve. The word is used when Martha was serving Jesus, uh, like when she was uh, doing all the cooking and preparing, her sister Mary sitting at Jesus' feet while she was running around ministering. You know, we often say, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that means I'm a servant of the gospel. It's also used when, um, when they, the, the, this, in, the, in the book of Acts, when the church was growing and they needed to find some people to help serve the widow's food, they chose ministers, diakonos. And it said they had to be full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. And they chose seven men to serve. Some may think that this gift is, um, you know, not the best gift. I mean, serving. I don't, a servant. It's not a great gift. My job is, uh, the, jo- the job of a servant or the gift of, of, of a servant is someone who's always ready to help, no matter what it is. It's cooking, it's cleaning, shopping, repairing, building, just ready to serve, no matter what needs to be done. 
They're often behind the scenes where no one sees them, no one's looking, no one knows about it, but they're faithful to serve others. Many might look down on this gift because there's not a lot of reward, because you're not being seen. But Jesus says, if anyone desires to be first, he should be last and the servant of all. So though that may not be a great gift in our eyes, I want to preach, I want to prophesy, I want to heal. God says, if you want to be number one, you want to be great in God's kingdom, then you would be a servant. So it's a great gift. It's a gift that that God rewards in his kingdom. It says he who teaches in teaching. Another gift is teaching. Jesus commanded his, all of his disciples to go and make disciples, teaching them all things I've commanded unto you. So we're all supposed to teach others, but there's also a gift of teaching. And the gift of teaching is God has given you an ability to teach other, his word, other people his word. You're able to explain it. You're able to understand it. You're able to explain it. If you have the gift of teaching, you're probably also going to be in love with God's Word. You're going to spend time in God's Word. You're going to read God's Word. You're going to study God's Word because ultimately you can't teach others unless God is teaching you. Has God given you the gift of teaching? If he has, well, we've got lots of opportunities for teaching. And if you would love to teach, we need teachers for children's ministry. We need teachers for youth group. We need teachers for men and teachers for women. We need teachers. We want to start more home Bible studies in this community. And we need teachers who want to teach God's word. And God has given you that calling to teach his word. It says he who exhorts in exhortation. There's a gift of exhortation. And that's somebody, you know what, no matter what you're going through, they come along beside you and they want to exhort you. They want to lift you up. They want to bring you strength and comfort. It's that person that always comes and always, you know, how are you doing? I'm praying for you. And, and just comes alongside. The word literally means, you know what the word literally means? To come alongside. It's actually a, a word similar. has the same root and base as the Holy Spirit. To come alongside and to help us. Our comforter. That's the gift of exhortation. No matter what you're going through, they'll come alongside you and help you through it. Hold your hand. Lift you up. Encourage you with their words. But also encourage you and help you go through whatever you're going through. To come alongside of you. Do you have that gift? Has God God given you that gift where you can just encourage people no matter what they're at and no matter what they're going through? If it is, then use that gift. That's an amazing gift. Amazing gift that someone can come alongside and just bring joy and comfort to other people. He who gives with liberality, there's a gift of giving. You know, we're all commanded to give, right? We're all, you know, in the Old Testament to give a tithe. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. But there's also the gift of giving. And this is a person who gives um, without a second thought. They give without expecting anything in return. They give from the heart. They give cheerfully. They give oftentimes even to their own hurt, thinking of others more than themselves. I think of the widow who put the two mites in the offering. Jesus is standing there. He's watching all these people put in the offering. The rich, the rich leaders, they come and they put in all kinds of money. And Jesus said, out of all the people, that widow gave the most because they gave from their excess, but she gave everything that she had. The gift, the gift of giving. It's a gift to give to others. You enjoy it. It's like, man, I, I, I just want to give to others. I, I enjoy it. I don't even want them to know the gift of giving. He who leads with diligence. God has given some people the gift of leadership. They have vision and courage to walk in faith. They lead with diligence, which means earnestness or dedication to see that the job is accomplished. In other words, they don't give up, but they see it through to the end. They lead by example and not by force. Jesus said, Mark 10 Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to be great among you shall be a servant. So the Bible talks about a great leader is a servant. We lead by our examples and by serving others. Has God given you the gift of leading? If so... 
Are you leading others? God's given you that gift. He's given it to you to use for the growth of the body and to bring glory and honor to him. Are you leading others? If not, if God has given you that gift, he's calling you to do that by your example. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. The last gift that Paul describes here in in Romans is the gift of mercy, compassion, or love towards others. Once again, this is probably someone who always wants to help. They always have mercy and compassion on others. Remember the word mercy is to, 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 to have compassion, to not punish someone like they deserve, but they come alongside them. You know, maybe this is someone who, who serves and helps the poor or the homeless or the orphan or the immigrant. There's someone who really wants to help others, has compassion upon them, sees someone who's suffering and wants to help them with whatever they're going through. I think of Matthew 25, 40, when it talks about the end and, and everyone will stand before God. And, and, it's, and he says, you know, when I was weak, you comforted me. When I was in the hospital, you visited me. When I was in jail, you came. When I was poor, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. That's the gift of mercy. And Jesus said, as certainly as you did this to one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. As we show mercy and compassion to people, ultimately we're doing it unto the Lord Jesus as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto him. So the gifts that he talks about today, remember, he's talking about the gifts and saying, you know, the body of Christ. Present your lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Ultimately, he says, don't do it in your own power or might, but I've given you a gift, and you would use that gift as a living sacrifice unto me. I've given it to you so that you can serve me with it. What are these different gifts? He talks about them, prophecy and ministry and teaching, exhorting, giving, leading, mercy, there's also the gifts in Roman, I mean in 1 Corinthians 12, which is a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, <clears throat> faith, healing, miracles, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpreting tongues, helps, administration. He also gives gifts in Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of all the gifts is the gift of love. We are the body of Christ. We've been called. Paul begs us, pleads with us. Based upon God's mercy, we would give our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. We would use the gifts that God has given us through his Holy Spirit to serve the body of Christ. So I ask the question again, what is your gift? Do you know the gift that God has given you? We look down this list in Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians. What has God given to you? Has God called you to be a teacher? Has God called you to be a servant? Has God given you the gift of of prophecy? Ultimately, if you don't know, my encouragement would be to seek the Lord. Lord, what, what, what gift have you given me? How can I serve the body of Christ? I want to use, be used by you. I, want, I don't want to do it in my own power, in my own might, in my own strength, but through the power and gifting of the Holy Spirit. If you don't know the gift that God has given to you, then ask. He says, we have not because we ask not. He says, how, if, if, if you, being a good father, know how to give good gifts to your son, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So if you don't know your gift, ask. Maybe you have more than one gift. But are you using your gift to serve the body of Christ for the benefit of all and to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God? If you don't know your gift, what, what, what do you like to do? What are you good at? God wants to use that for him. Maybe you work in construction. Well, that's a gift that God wants to use because there's people that have a need that you can serve. Maybe you're good at administration and numbers. Well, God wants to use that. Maybe you, you just love helping people. That's a gift. We would use those gifts for God's glory. And then as we use those gifts, God will be glorified. We would be a light unto a lost and hurting world. We would show the love of God to those around us. 
Maybe God's given you the gift of teaching. He's calling you to start a Bible study at your home. Maybe he's given you the gift of evangelism. Well, let's go and evangelize. Let's go share the love of Jesus. Amen. Let's be those living sacrifices. Notice it's a sacrifice, right? A sacrifice is sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's going to take time. It's going to take work. Uh, you know, I, I have the gift of evangelism, but sometimes I've got I've to say, I, I, I don't want to share. I don't want to stand up right now, God. I don't want to answer that door, even though, you know, I know that it's an opportunity for me to share. I don't want to open my voice, but God, I'm going to be, I'm going to sacrifice my desire and what I want so that I can do your good and perfect will and bring you honor and glory and serve the body of Christ. So let's be the body of Christ. Let's give him our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him, set apart from sin, and using our gifts to to encourage one another, to teach one another, and to reach a lost and hurting world. Amen? So let's stand. We're going to close in a word of prayer, but I mean, in a a worship song. Before we do, I want to pray. And I actually want to pray for for us. I want to pray for the gifts of the Spirit. I want to pray that we would be a church who would walk in the power and the gifts of the Spirit instead of the power of ourselves. I want to pray that we would sacrifice our lives, our time, our everything that we are, we would give it to Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, we come before you today as the body of Christ. Lord, you bought us with a price. You paid for us, Lord. You died on the cross for our sins, Lord, so that we could be set free from sin. We be given life, become a new creation, and so that we could, Lord, live our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. So we come to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, but help us, Lord, to live for you. Help us, Lord, to to each and every single day get up and, and, Lord, seek after your will for the day. Lord, who do you want me to talk to? What do you want me to do? How can I help somebody? How can I teach somebody? What can I say? What can I do, Lord? Here I am. Lead me, guide me, show me. Lord, help us, Lord, to not do it in our own strength, in our own might, Lord, but through the power of your spirit. And maybe somebody here today doesn't know what their gift is, Lord. I pray that as they seek you, as they sit at your feet, as they spend time in your word, Lord, you show them, Lord, what gift you've given them and how they can serve you, how they can serve the body. Lord, I believe that you've given a gift to each one of us, and each and every single one of our gifts are important to serve you and serve the body, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you would show us what that is, and you would help us to walk in obedience and sacrifice, Lord. Even when it's hard, even when we don't want to, Lord, we deny ourselves, Lord, and we would live for you. Lord, renew our minds. Help us to be holy and set apart. Lord, give us those gifts so we can walk in faithfulness and love. Lord, we pray for prophets. We pray for the gift of healing. Lord, we pray, Lord, for the gift of teaching, of compassion. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would give us the gifts, Lord. Most importantly, the gift of love. Give us all the gift of love, Lord. Lord, that we would love as you love. We would love the lost. We would love the hurting. Lord, we'd love those who need, Lord, to be loved. We would love the body, one another, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Be glorified in us. Be glorified through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you, after church, we're going to have over here the elders praying. If you're not sure what your gift is, if you want to serve God, and you're like, but I don't know how, I don't know what, the elders want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would show you what that gift is so you can glorify him, presenting your body as a living sacrifice. Amen. Let's worship to the Lord together. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good.
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let Never gonna let me down Cause you are good Good Oh You are good Good Oh Amen Amen. Grace and peace be with you this morning, church.